Uh, have you ever gotten so familiar with something that you just don't even notice it? Like, have you ever gotten so familiar with something that, like, you don't even smell certain things anymore, you don't notice certain things, you don't see certain things? This happens a lot at the fragrance counter at the department store. For those two of you that still go to a department store, uh, when you go to this fragrance counter, you start to smell all of these different fragrances that are offered, and eventually, everything starts to smell exactly the same, which, little pro tip, is why they have that little jar of coffee beans, you know, that's, that somehow resets your palate, nose palate. Is there a palate for the nose? I don't know. It, it resets things for you, which is just further proof that God can use coffee in your life for a multitude of things. <laughs> Amen. It happens to us in our daily commute. Like, have you ever been driving from your house to work, and you take the 10-minute commute, or if you're going to L.A., the four-hour commute, and you go from home to work, and you're like, I don't even remember driving. Like, I'm not the only one, right? You guys aren't going to turn me in. This is a safe space. You're not going to have my driver's license revoked. It happens all the time when we get familiar, it happens at home, it happens at work, in your office, in your living room, when you get so familiar with the environment that you don't even notice that the clock hasn't even been working the last three months, <laughs> right? We can get so familiar with things that we just miss certain things in our life. And we're approaching one of those texts that we're uber familiar with. A text that we are, are, are just almost so familiar with because we've been so inundated with it all throughout our life from all sides of our life. We've heard this text re recited in churches. Uh, we've seen this text show up in movies. We see it plastered on the walls of locker rooms and hospital rooms. Uh, we've seen this prayer so often because it's so famous. This is one of those passages that, that likely for the majority of us, if not all of us who are Christians, maybe who are seeking, maybe who want nothing to do with Jesus, we all have some level of familiarity with. And this morning, we're approaching that text in the most famous sermon ever given. It's the most famous prayer and the most famous sermon ever written, and it's really just the centerpiece of the Sermon on the Mount. But more than just a centerpiece, more than just a, a placeholder, the, the Lord's Prayer is a distillation of Jesus' entire life and ministry in just a few short words, which shows us from the outset of this prayer that Jesus isn't just giving us a model prayer for his disciples to pray. No, he's not just giving us some religious babble and some religious phrases to grab a hold to when life goes sideways. This prayer is what... Jesus was actually living out in his own life. Everybody in that day knew that if a Jewish rabbi were to give you a prayer, not only would you pray that prayer and play that with great, pray that with great veracity and great passion, but that in that prayer you would begin to partner with God in making that prayer a reality in your life, which from the outset, before we even dive into this prayer, we gotta know that prayer foundationally isn't just words to God, but prayer is a partnership in what God is doing. And Jesus in this prayer starts by inviting us, not just showing us how to pray, but inviting us to this life of prayer. This prayer that we're about to read animated the early church gave life to the early church in ways they were desperately needing life and hope. And I believe that this prayer can reshape our lives today, reorient us, re, uh, rearrange and reorder our life today. Now, whether this prayer has become so familiar in your life that you miss certain things about it, that it's become so routine that it's lost its significance in your life, or, or you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. You never could imagine praying to a God that you have no relationship with. Wherever you're at today, can I just invite you, in this moment, in the next two and a half hours, would you just lean in to what God has for you in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says this, pray then... Like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven, on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I recognize and I realize that it, it, just full disclosure, there's a lot to this passage, so much so that I want us to spend the next two weeks in this very passage and unpacking as we drill into what Jesus has for us here. We're going to spend two weeks in this text so that we don't miss anything Jesus has for us. But if I'm being honest, we could spend the next 10 weeks and split this out and still have depths to explore. Now, with that said, I can't possibly, even in two weeks, tackle everything that Jesus is saying here. But the good news is, you don't need me, you don't need some professional pastor to help you to explore these truths that Jesus has for you. You can do this on your own. You can do this in community, in a small group. But just as a way of a reminder, Jesus is teaching to an audience 2,000 years ago, which doesn't mean that what Jesus is about to say is irrelevant for us today, 2,000 years later. But what it does mean is that there's a very specific context that matters greatly in understanding this. What did it mean to those who were originally hearing Jesus say this? Uh, we ask that question, what does, it, what does it mean for them and their context so that we can better understand what implications it has for us in our context? Now, this was a context of high religion. This was a group of people that was inundated and saturated in Scripture. In this audience, as Jesus was giving us this prayer, in the audience then when Jesus was teaching, there were no doubt religious leaders. There were historical Hebrews who'd had long-standing history in their culture and their relationship with God. And so what that meant was when Jesus used certain phrases that had been threaded all throughout the Old Testament, it would have triggered in their mind something that would have taken them back to a certain history where God showed up in their life. And so Jesus starts this prayer. He says, pray like this, our Father. Now, as Jesus opens his prayer, when most of us hear a phrase like this, our minds naturally and immediately go to our relationship or maybe a lack of a relationship with our earthly father, which totally makes sense. Let me just tell you, this can be problematic for us because if our, very ex if our various experiences of our earthly father are the beginning point of our relationship with our heavenly father, it can be an issue. If, it dic if our earthly father relationship dictates our relationship with our heavenly father, if that's the beginning point, it can muddle our theology. And our understanding of the character of God and the nature of God was never meant to be shaped by our earthly experiences. Rather, our understanding of God ought to be shaped from truth from God. Because the reality is God isn't abstract. God isn't different for each and every one of us. What Jesus is doing as he opens the prayer with our Father is anchoring this prayer in this conversation with God, in something concrete. So the first century hearer would have heard Jesus say, our father, and would have been hearkened back to a time when their ancestors were enslaved in Egypt. It was this time in history in the people of God where they were enslaved and oppressed and, and, and depressed and walking through this difficult season. It was a time where their ancestors were making mud bricks for the for the kingdom and the empire of Egypt. In this moment, God comes in and tells Moses that he wants to partner with Moses to help bring God's people out into freedom. God shows up and tells Moses, hey, go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh this. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. He may and I say to you, let my son go so that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I'll kill your firstborn son. And so if, God, if Israel is God's son, then that makes God 
Israel's father, which, side note, this is the very first time in all of Scripture where God has identified himself as our father. And he is the father who sets his people free. But for the next 1,400 years, God's people continued in their story under this oppressive boot of empires that would lead them away from home, away from God, away from their life, into a life of exile. And so when they hear that God is a good father, they'll remember and they'll go back to this moment with Jesus beginning a prayer, remembering that God is a God who acts and rescues. I can imagine as these several hundred settlers are sitting on a hillside listening to Jesus, there are no doubt many people, if not every single person, that would hear this phrase and think, oh, Jesus is going to lead us to a second exodus. He's going to deliver us from the oppression of Rome. And they would have been excited in that moment, but the reality was for Jesus, he's not saying this to give them a second exodus. Jesus isn't delivering his people from Rome. He's setting us free from sin and death. Jesus is not just praying and teaching us how to pray. He's in this very moment living it out because we know the end of the story. And the story reminds us to the very first story, which reminds us that our God has acted throughout human history. All throughout human history, God has worked and moved and delivered and rescued. He's worked then, and he delivered people from slavery and oppression. He delivered people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he's still working and acting in our story today. Come on, somebody. He's a God who sees and hears. He's a God who makes promises and keeps every single promise. God is a God who's the perfect parent, who created us, who loves us, who knows us, and he wants the best for us. Our Father immediately reorients our life and our heart to be reminded that we are children of a perfect heavenly Father. Our Father in heaven. And when we think about heaven, we often think about where God resides. Uh, When I think about heaven, there are times, honestly, where I just think about Knoxville, Tennessee, where the Tennessee football team resides. I think there's a little bit of heaven on earth. But let's talk about this reality that Where God resides is everywhere, every place at all times. It's this $5 theological word called the omnipresence of God, which means that God is everywhere at all times and all places. Now, as Jesus says, our Father in heaven, he's not discounting the reality and and the theological truth that God is everywhere at all times by saying, no, God is just in heaven. But again, the first century hearers would have remembered and been reminded of this idea in their own context because the ancients thought about the universe in a three-tiered system. Because remember, at this point when Jesus is very first time giving us this prayer, there was no Hubble telescope. JFK had not famously said, we're going to send a man to the moon. Google Earth had not finished coding at that point in the first century. Galileo had not controversially announced that the world is round and that it orbits around the sun. None of this had happened yet. And so for an ancient to understand heavens and earth, there was this three-tier system. There's the heavens above, the earth beneath, and the waters below. They didn't understand and know how everything worked, but they knew that we stand on earth. And they looked up to the heavens above, stood on the earth beneath, and could see some of the waters below. And they understood that God rules and reigns, and that nothing happens without God making it happen. Oftentimes when we think about God, especially God being in heaven, we think about God as being way out there. He's separated from us. God doesn't really know what's going on with us and in our world. Yes, God rules and reigns. But God is also present. He's close to us, as close as the air that we breathe. And as Jesus prays, our Father in heaven, this reorients our minds and our hearts that God's power isn't limited to heaven. God's power is universal. Jesus says, our Father in heaven. 
hallowed be your name. Now, hallowed isn't really a term that we use uh, a whole lot in these days, but it's a word that means holy and set apart. It, it means to honor or to revere. But, but as Jesus prays this prayer, he is making this plea that God would act in such a way in our world today that people would see him for who he truly, truly is, set apart, different, remarkable, irresistible. But again, this prayer that is more than just an inspiration to us, it's an invitation for us. It's not just a prayer. It's not just words that we use and words that we utter. It's an invitation for us to partner with God in this set-apartness. Throughout the Old Testament, God gave his people his words. We have those words here in Scripture. So they knew, as God gave them his words, they knew how to represent what mattered to God in their own life and to the world around them. Their lives and our lives are a message to the world about who God is and what God is like. We're in partnership with the living God of the universe. We literally bear the name of God, which means this invitation that we talked about a couple of weeks ago to not take God's name in vain goes so much deeper than just being careful with our words. There's this iconic blessing in Numbers chapter 6. A blessing that maybe you know, a blessing that maybe you've sung, a blessing that says this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. That's in Numbers chapter 6. And the very next phrase right after this blessing says this, so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. We bear the name of God. The problems came for God's people when they didn't act like the God who had called them and created them. The same problems show up in our own life today. When we don't bear the name of God as ambassadors of God, that leads us like it led them to one place, and that place is exile. And so when Jesus prays, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. There's this realization that, yes, God works in the world, but we have a part to play in it if we're Christians. Uh, this, this idea that Jesus is talking about, our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy, revered, honored, is your name, brings with it that, that we are the messengers of Jesus as Christians. We're the message of Jesus to our coworkers, our classmates the people that we interact with on a regular basis. We are called to bear his name, which means, translation, how we live matters. How we run our businesses matters. How we treat others matters. How we treat the poor and the needy matters. How we treat refugees and immigrants, it matters. How we conduct ourselves at youth Rec soccer games on a Saturday matters. I'm just saying. How we, how we post online matters because we bear the name of Jesus and how we live our life matters. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This idea of kingdom is deeply embedded into the book of Matthew. More than 50 times it shows up in the gospel of Matthew. John the Baptist came to announce, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's arriving, y'all. Here it comes. If Jesus, if, if, uh, if John weren't a first century Jewish man, he probably would have said it this way. If he were in the south, he would have said, buckle up, buttercup, here it comes. If you were a redneck, you would have said, hold my beer, watch this. Jesus' kingdom is coming. And so often I hear this phrase that the kingdom of God is already here, and at the same time, it's not yet. Meaning that we can experience some of the kingdom of God, and then there are certain things about the kingdom of God that we can't experience yet until we get to heaven. And I think that's a good statement. I just think it's incomplete. 
I think a better idea is that the kingdom of God is already here, but the best is yet to come. That, that God's kingdom is showing up in tangible ways here, and it's even going to get better when we're in heaven. John the Baptist announced it. Jesus lived it, and God's kingdom is advancing. This is the very message of Jesus, and what Jesus is talking about is this reality where things on earth are lived and led the way that God had intended them. Dallas Willard defined kingdom like this. Kingdom, Dallas Willard says, is the range of your effective will. It's that space where everything begins to happen in our lives exactly the way that we want them to happen. We get what we want. Our kingdom is what's important, which we would all probably at least publicly say, it's not about my kingdom, but it's just what we do when we get the things the way that we want. And we can look at what happens here on earth and we can clearly say life is not functioning the way that God intended. Life on earth is just happening a little bit differently. No doubt, Sherlock. But we can go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, those very first pages of Scripture, and see exactly the way that God intended for life to be. But the very moment that Adam and Eve took from the tree, sin and death and pain and heartache and brokenness all came flooding into our world, and now the earth functions differently than heaven does. But the gospel reminds us that God is working in a way to bring the goodness of heaven back to invade the earth to the point that there is no more pain, to the point that there's no more brokenness, no more chaos. And all of that happened and culminated at the cross in an empty tomb. But at this point in the story, as Jesus is giving us this prayer, the cross and the resurrection hasn't happened yet. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about the rule and reign of God advancing here on earth in such a way that brings healing and wholeness by pushing out chaos. Listen, what makes the gospel good news isn't that we get eternal life when we die. Isn't that we get to go to heaven when it's all over. What makes all of this good news isn't that he just changes eternity, which may be news for some of you. Maybe maybe you grew up in a tradition that basically said, heaven is good, earth is bad. And Jesus came from heaven, which was good, down to earth in the bad to take us all from the bad back up to the good. The problem with this is that when we read the Bible, we see the life of Jesus and everything he did and everything he said was talking about how to get the goodness and the power of heaven to come to earth here. Yeah, there's absolutely a heaven where we as followers of Jesus will go when we die, but we get to live and bring heaven down to everywhere that we live. The end of the story in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 tells us, paints the picture for us of what heaven is like. And this is what John writes in Revelation 21 verse 4. He will wipe away, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The old has passed away. Heaven and earth are now functioning the way God designed all the way back at the beginning. The reality for us is you and I, we each have our own kingdoms. Sure, they're little k kingdoms. Sure, they're sub-kingdoms. They're our own spheres of influence where we make the decisions Those decisions impact our families. Those decisions we make impact the organizations that we lead. Those those decisions impact the neighborhoods that we live in. And this prayer from Jesus realigns our minds and our hearts to remember that these kingdoms that we have ought to be oriented to the kingdom of God. Because God wants to work through us to advance his kingdom through how we spend our money, through how we leverage our influence, because God has uniquely gifted each and every one of us and strategically placed us right where he wants us in the world. And he wants us to remember that he hasn't put us here to advance our own little kingdoms. It's not about your story, and it's not about my story. It's not about your kingdom. It's not about my kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. 
That's all that matters in our life, which is why Jesus wants us to pray this way, because it anchors us. It recalibrates us. It reminds us why we're here, and it helps us to reorganize and recognize that we've got a role to play in seeing God's kingdom advance here on earth. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Reorient, reorient us to God's purpose and plan for our life. Our will oriented with his will. Jesus closes with three petitions, two of which we're going to cover today, one of which we're going to deep dive in next Sunday. Jesus says this, give us this day our daily bread. Think back a little bit. Is there any point in any story of God where he provided for them daily bread? Yes, there is. For 40 straight years, God didn't change the menu from bread. God provided and sent literally on a daily basis manna from heaven. This word manna is the Hebrew word man. Literally, if you translate man, it translates into a phrase, what is this? Literally, nobody could figure it out. Maybe it feels like a Thanksgiving dinner at your family's house. I'm just saying, manna was coming from heaven. And daily bread was a reminder that God could be trusted, that God is a provider. And bread became this literal symbol for daily sustenance. But manna was also metaphorical. This whole idea is what, what do you need in order to fulfill the mission God's called you to do? But here's where we get this prayer all wrong. We miss the placement of, God, give me everything that I need. God, would you come through in what I need you to come through? We start our prayers in the middle. God, I need this. God, I need that. And Jesus places this, give me my daily bread, right in the middle, in the heart, in the center of the prayer, not at the beginning, not at the end, but in the middle because he knows that what we what we sometimes ask for in our life could derail the call of God on our life. And God, here's what I need to fulfill the mission today. Would you give, would you give us our daily bread? Because so many of us can get distracted by what we need in our life that could distract us that the mission God has for our life. Have you ever noticed that the entire prayer up to this point is plural? Our Father, our daily bread. Yes, there's certainly an individual component to prayer, but there's also a communal element to it too. We need God to provide in our life. And hello, somebody else is praying for God to provide in their life. God, here's what I need in my life today, but there's also another brother, there's also another sister who needs their daily bread. We gotta recognize it as a community of Christians, we may have what they need to fulfill what they're calling them to, which means, translation, how can I, how can you be the answer to someone else's prayer? I just spent the last week in Africa, in West Africa, in villages that have literally never heard the name of Jesus. You walk in and ask them if they've ever heard of Jesus, and they don't even have categories because they've never heard the gospel. And I was there last week, and we met this lady named Christian. And about a year and a half ago, she met Jesus when uh, local villagers who knew the gospel and loved Jesus came in and told her the greatest story that's ever been told. She met Jesus and began to pray the Lord's Prayer. And as she was praying this prayer, she just felt like God was leading her to live beyond her life. And she felt like God was leading her to this village called Ahume. She'd never even heard of this village. The village was three miles from her. She hadn't even ventured out to know that there's a village called Ahume. So she started praying, God, would you just lead me? Would your spirit lead me to this village that you're calling me to that I received in a dream? And so she just been, begins walking every day. What's the name of your village? Nope, it's not Ahume. It's not where God's called me. Day after day, she goes to village after village until she comes to this village that has never heard the name Jesus. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around, but there are places on planet Earth that have never heard about Jesus. She comes into this village, and there's a lot of the villagers just surrounding this home. And at this point, she doesn't know that this is the village of Ahume, but she goes in, and these villagers have been crying out for help screaming out for help because for the last three years, 
Every year there's been at least 17 children die under the age of five in their village. And they're just crying out, somebody help us. Would somebody do something? Christian walks into this village and says, can I pray for you? They don't know what that means. This is a village that is run and dominated by witchcraft and voodoo. They talk to and they worship a python. That's crazy. And so Christian comes in and prays in the name of Jesus. And this five-year-old boy who was on his deathbed is healed miraculously. And the village gives their life to Jesus. Totally changed. But, but Christian, as she was praying this prayer, recognized and realized that we're part of a community that's bigger than us. And sometimes God's called you to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Now, it's not to say that everyone is healed miraculously by God, but when God heals, it's always for his glory. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those with debts against us. We're going to cover that next week. And Jesus wraps up the prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus reminds us in this moment that God never tempts anyone. We need to delineate and know the difference between a temptation and a test. A temptation is any enticement that gets a person to do something that God doesn't want. Satan tempts. A test, on the other hand, is to get a person to prove themselves faithful to God's will. God tests people. Now, if you're living faithfully, you will face opposition. If you're a threat to the enemy, you will be tempted. Tim Mackey says it this way, every, every day... We need to be reminded that following Jesus is hard, especially in South Orange County. Every day, we need to be reminded that following Jesus is hard and that great tests and trials will come our way. We have to remind ourselves that they are not signs that the Father has abandoned us. When things go bad, it doesn't mean God's gone dark. They're actually paradoxically signs that the Father is with us and that God will deliver us through in some way. Though for many, it's meant giving up their life, and that included Jesus. I love how the prayer ends. As we've all learned it, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, if you're looking in your Bible for that phrase, you're actually not going to find it. Uh, scholars estimate that this phrase was kind of added as an addition to the prayer, not in Scripture, but in our, in our communal life. But what I love about this phrase is that it reminds us that regardless of what happens in our lives here on earth, God's kingdom will rule the day. Re regardless of what happens in our, in our kids' lives, God's kingdom will rule the day. Regardless of who is elected in several months, God's kingdom will rule the day. Regardless of what happens in your life, in your family, God's will will advance. He wins in the end, and nothing can take away what God has already given. If you're a follower of Jesus, you can know that this life will throw whatever it wants at you, but that does not get the final say God does. And so I want us to pray together. And as we pray, I just want us to pray this prayer together. Maybe as you're sitting there, you'd like to pray it out loud. Maybe as you're sitting there, you'd like to mutter it under your breath. However you pray it, whatever posture you take, would you just lean into this moment? So let's pray it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen.